Linda. Thank you. I'm Judy. Thank you, Linda, for that. Um, so today we're going to be talking about subarachnoid hemorrhage, which, you know, is and always continues to be the hottest topic of neurocritical care. I know my colleagues have given other talks about ICH and TBI, um, but subarachnoid hemorrhage has it all. And we will get to that. And this is, this is an extremely ginormous aneurysm. Okay. Anywho. All right. So you are, okay, this brain image, unfortunately, is over this text, but okay. You are called to see a 58-year-old woman who presents with worst headache of life while working um, on her taxes. She took two ibuprofen, nothing has helped. She presented to the ED after the headache. Um, and, you know, after it didn't go away for two hours, a 78-year-old woman with hypertension diabetes found down unresponsive in cardiac arrest. EMS is activated and intubated at the scene with ongoing CPR. A 60-year-old man whose father passed away from a subarachnoid hemorrhage states that he has had a headache and right-sided leg weakness. Family noted that he was off and activated EMS. So you already saw the title slide <laughs> of the talk, but what do all of these patients have in common? Um, they have aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. And, you know, hopefully by the end of this talk, um, you'll be able to kind of go through these, or go through, we'll go through these objectives. You'll be able to describe the signs and symptoms of an aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, recognize the proper assessment stabilization, um, the complications of subarachnoid hemorrhage, review when to clip or coil an aneurysm, identify the signs and symptoms of vasospasm, explain the treatment of vasospasm, um, and kind of define delayed cerebral ischemia, or better known as DCI. So aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. It is best, it's been, it was best described to me once as the sprint and then the marathon. So let's focus on the sprint first. When somebody comes in, with um, you know, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, 10% of these patients die before even reaching the ED. 25%, oh, are my slides moving? No, you're still on the sprint slide. Okay, it, it, you do see people sprinting though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, sorry. It's, it's frozen on my other screen. Okay, um, all right. Um, but 25% of people die in the first 24 hours. So what does that mean? You know, we have to make a rapid diagnosis when somebody comes in with signs and symptoms, which we'll go over. You want to make that rapid diagnosis. You want to have aggressive blood pressure control. Do you want to, you want to think about, um, well, I forgot to put the ABCs, but that's always number one, but an EVD or not to EVD, are they seizing? Are they not seizing, et cetera, et cetera. And then aneurysmal securement as soon as possible. And that ends the sprint. And then you're gonna be part of the marathon. So the post-securement phase. So this is gonna be when you're telling their loved ones, their friends, their family, their coworkers, whomever, that they decide is able to hear their information, um, uh, you know, that they are going to be here for 21 days, maybe longer. And what do we try to focus on then? We try to focus on hemodynamic, and oxygenation management. We try to focus on vasospasm diagnosis and um, treatment and delayed cerebral ischemia prevention. So this will just be a case that we work through. 45 year old woman again, developed sudden onset headache characterized as right-sided and worst headache of her life while she is at work typing up a manuscript. She took two Advil and nothing helped. Coworkers noted her to be off and called EMS. In the ED, her blood pressure was 190 over 85, heart rate was 101, satting 100% on room air. While in the ED, she starts to become lethargic and require frequent stimulation to arouse. So she comes in and what do you guys think? What, what do you wanna do when you see her? Also, I, don't, I can't seem to see the chat. Anybody? A a anybody want to guess what we should do? Oh, oh, there's the chat. Excellent. Okay. Yes. Okay. Shauna. Good. Yes. Non -con yes. ABCs, non-con head CT, CT, CTA. Love it. Um, perfect. So exactly. We are thinking 
you know, given the the title of this talk, it's, you know, okay, well, it's, we'll get ahead CT. She's otherwise stable, Jenny. ABCs look good. And we get this head CT. Um, can somebody tell me what we're looking at? Obviously, okay, it's an axial head CT. Um, and just for um, some of our, um, our, our other learners, you know, this is the front, you know, these are frontal lobes, this is ventricle. What, what do we see right here? What is, what is this kind of, oh yes, someone. Yes, th thick subarachnoid hemorrhage blood in the cisterns, classic star sign, exactly. So this is the star. Oh wait, let me see if I can draw. Yes. Oh, no, that didn't work. Nope. Okay, sorry, I can't draw. Okay, um, that didn't work out well. Okay, so this star sign here is the classic star sign. It is thick blood, and we will go over that. So the subarachnoid hemorrhage. And what do what are these little um, hypodense structures here that we see on this cut? Anybody have any guesses? Yes, temporal horns. Excellent. So yes, this means you know enlarged temporal horn, and yes, excellent early hydrocephalus. Great, you guys are really doing well. Um, so there's, so, so there's hydrocephalus and, and likely it's, it's obviously obstructive hydrocephalus. Okay. Um, <laughs> I love you guys too. Okay. So, sub, sorry, I'm reading into the chat. Subarachnoid hemorrhage. So the most common cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage, and what does that mean? It's, it's blood in the subarachnoid space, um, is trauma, right? So the majority of subarachnoid hemorrhage that people will see will be in trauma. However, that's not what we're talking about today. So we're talking about aneurysms um, and they are different types of subarachnoid hemorrhage. So um, the most common cause of non-traumatic um, subarachnoid hemorrhage is aneurysmal rupture because you do have um, a differential diagnosis of, of dissection, perimesis cephalic, amyloid, RCBS, coagulopathy, vasculitis, um, sympa sympamimetic drugs, sympathomimetic drugs, et cetera, that can cause subarachnoid hemorrhage and that is not due to trauma. So for non-traumatic causes, aneurysm is the most common cause. Okay, so epidemiology of non-traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, you know, nine in 100,000, it increases with age, average age is 53 years old. So it is something that affects young people, makes up about 3% of all strokes and has high mortality, 30 to 50% um, with significant morbidity. You know, it's so 17 to 50% decrease. Uh, there has been a worldwide in case fatality rate. And, you know, it's decreased because of something very important neurocritical care. So I had to improve treatment strategies, but um, just a shout out to the neurocritical care people out there. Okay. So signs and symptoms, how, you know, so now we're talking about it and we're all worried that the next patient we'll see in the ED has a worse headache of life. And, and how do we know that they have a subarachnoid hemorrhage? So again, thunderclap headache, classic. I'm sure you all learned about it textbook wise. Um, you know, thunderclap headache, worst headache of life, less than a minute. It went from zero to 10 quickly and out of nowhere. Um, but the truth is subarachnoid hemorrhage headaches can be any type of headache. Um, that's why it's so important to get a headache history, especially if somebody has migraines, trying to differentiate between, um, you know, the two, or if there is any difference or um, the different types of headache quality, you know, that uh, your, your patient's experiencing, but it doesn't have to be a, a whole, like the worst headache of their life. Nausea, vomiting, neck pain, photophobia. So, you know, these are due to blood, right? So nausea, vomiting, maybe they have elevated ICP, maybe they have hydrocephalus, maybe they just have blood in the brain that's irritating and it's making them nauseous. Neck pain, right? Meningismus from having that blood 
all along. Um, uh, photophobia, there should be another O there. Um, you know, and then to coma and loss of consciousness. You can also have focal neurologic deficits, intraocular hemorrhages, cranial nerves. It, it doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be, you know, it, it literally can present in any way. Um, and so non-classic symptoms, you know, a sentinel headache, right? So when you have some, a, a person with an aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage that you can speak to, um, or maybe asking their family, um, you know, if they had any headaches before this, and sometimes you'll hear that they actually had a really terrible headache, you know, two to eight weeks prior, well, let's say two weeks prior. And that was actually their, their real, uh, it was the first time that the aneurysm leaked out and there's blood in the brain. And now maybe it's the bigger rupture. And this is important um, when we talk about your vasospasm window and where you really are in that window. Are you post bleed day zero? Or are you post bleed day seven? Um, so it really is important to ask about prior headaches. And again, 40% of patients with um, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage will actually have an, a normal neuro exam without meningismus. So making sure that you really um, ask about the history um, and you know getting a sense from the patient and also from uh, or if they have other contacts. Okay. So the circle of Willis is kind of what we're looking at is the, you know, this is an angiogram. Um, it, you know, so the circle of Willis is the most common area for a saccular aneurysm formation, especially at where arteries start to branch off. And we're going to get into this in a little bit. Um, but we're going to talk about modifiable risk factors here, um, hypertension, smoking, alcohol use, and pathomimetic drugs, age, sex, there's a female um, predominance, polycystic kidney disease, um, connective tissue disorders, family history of subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, greater than two first uh, degree relatives, and you know being of black, Hispanic, Japanese, and Finnish descent. Um, so, it's actually, very, you know, there was a patient who um, had a bleed. He was in Mexico and uh, he AMA'd from that hospital. So he was Ill, a, a lower grade subarachnoid hemorrhage and came and he flew to DC. And then um, he AMA'd from the a DC hospital and then he came to us at Cornell. And um, he just had like a, he just had a, a, a strange, you know, um, creatinine, um, uh, trend. And so we decided to get a renal ultrasound and he had polycystic kidney disease. It was, you know, you always hear about it in the books. Um, and it was the first time. So anyway, that was just a random story, but to keep it in the back of your mind, because some, some patients do have it. Okay. And then also just aneurysm size greater than seven millimeters. Um, you know, this is taking a look at the size and risk of rupture um, at the five-year cumulative uh, risk of rupture rates according to size and location. So PCOM, um, uh, anterior, anterior cerebral, um, ACA, MCA, um, your ICA in your cavernous carotid artery. Okay, so the pathophysiology. Oh, and also anybody can ask questions at any point in time. So please feel free to just text in the chat. Um, so again, going back to aneurysms typically form at branching points along intracranial arteries. So this was, you know, these are, this is a brain artery. Um, you have your left ICA, your left MCA, uh, this is your ACA and um, blood's coming in, you know, so hypertension, right? Think about it. You have hemodynamic, hemodynamic stress, all of these vectors of stress and pressure going everywhere. Um, and then ultimately it's causing a, causing a weakening um, of this arterial wall. And then it causes an outpouching and you get an aneurysm. And so the most common sites are obviously where you have these branches. So your ACOM, your MCA, your PCA, and your basilar tip. So blood pushes, um, you know, into the sub. So the aneurysm ruptures, blood pushes into the subarachnoid space, which is, is seen here. Um, and it pushes at an arterial pressure, like, you know, obviously 
it you're, it's your you know your heart is squeezing your systolic your diastolic and you know this arterial pressure keeps pushing and the blood keeps rupturing until there is an equalization across the arterial and the intracranial pressure and you know across the rupture site and that's when it stops bleeding so um eventually right patients come in and there's a stabilization of blood okay so um just as we had talked about before when a patient comes in such as the young woman in our case um you always want to focus on ABCs. So here is a, a checklist from our Neurocritical Care Society. Uh, ABCs, CT head, getting all the labs. Um, tox screen is important. Uh, troponin, we'll get into that. But obviously, as you guys know from being um, in neurology, there is a connection between the brain and the heart. So you always want to check a troponin, 12 lead EKG. You want to target this blood pressure. Here it says less than 160, but commonly we do less than 140. You'll consult neurosurgery and neurocritical care and hydro, uh, address hydrocephalus if present. So again, going through this in just a little bit more of what we actually do. Initial assessment, obviously the ED, unless you're an ED provider. Um, you know, they'll do ABCs. Um, and then we come and we do the neurological exam, you know, level of consciousness, that's very important. Um, motor, cranial nerve, uh, com are they comatose? What are the pupils like? They get rushed to a head CT, CTA, you know, hydrocephalus. Should we put an EBD in? Again, you'll get your labs. And it's important because if there's a coagulopathy or you know that there's anticoagulant use, you want to reverse. Um, as in most um, intracranial hemorrhages. Again, you'll get an, e oops, an EKG and a TTE, SVP less than 140. And at certain institutions, you will start them on seizure prophylaxis and we'll get into that. So head CTs. So a CT head is quite sensitive. So within this first six hours, 93%, a CT head will detect subarachnoid hemorrhage 93% of the time, 99%. Um, of subarachnoid hemorrhages will be detected within 12 hours, 93% within the first 24 hours, 60% at seven days. So as you see, as we go out further, a head CT gets less and less sensitive. Um, you know, when we see a subarachnoid hemorrhage, we'll also usually get a CTA at the same time. And I just want to reiterate that CTAs do not rule out aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhages. CTAs are pretty sensitive and specific, but they miss small aneurysms, so four millimeters or less. And, you know, the, those kind of aneurysms can bleed. So angiogram is the gold standard. Um, and so we will get into that. So this is the complication rate of um, a digital subtraction angi angiogram. So it really, like the long story is here is age, um, here's number of examinations, and then here are the number of complications. So really reversible, transient, permanent. It's a really low complication rate. And what this is really saying is that the older you are, the more complications. But overall, it's about a 1% complication rate. And if your head CT is negative, then, well, it's already on the page, but you want to think about doing a lumbar puncture. Um, so you're going to be looking for xanthrochromia, which is the breakdown of blood. So that's why it's important be, to know where you are, like how long ago was your headache? Because these breakdown products have to take time to, to break down. Um, and it's the bilirubin that's what you're looking for, kind of this yellowish hue. And, you know, it's present four to 12 hours after the bleed. So roughly about, you know, present 12 hours after the bleed and nearly 100% of subarachnoid patient, patients, but it normally doesn't show up until four hours. So it's good to know when you've actually done the tap. Um, and a lumbar puncture less than four hours, we kind of do that whole thing where we're, we're trying to see, is it a traumatic tap or is it 
um, actually a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So you're going to be looking for the right, the red blood cell clearance. Now, a lot of people go by different rules of how do you say it's a trauma, it's a traumatic tab versus it's, it's actually, you know, a hemorrhage in the brain. Um, these are two rules in the literature, but honestly, I don't, anything could be potentially a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So I think you really have to put the lumbar puncture in the whole clinical picture. Do we have any questions so far? No? We all good so far? Okay. All right. So an MRI brain, um, this is the head CT, and then this is the MRI, and you can see the subarachnoid hemorrhage here. So SWI or GRE and flare um, have superior sensitivity in detecting subacute or chronic subarachnoid hemorrhage compared to CT head. Um, and, you know, sometimes within the first six hours, especially if you don't see it. Um, and then again, chronically. Okay. Now, th that being said, are you going to rush someone to MRI for a subarachnoid hemorrhage? I mean, most, no, you're, you're going to do the head CT first and then take a look. Um, okay. So when we see a patient and, you know, they have an aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage and we're doing their exam, we are also assessing something called their Hunt Hess grade or their Hunt Hess score. It was created by two neurosurgeons from the Ohio State University, which I despise because I went to Michigan, but um, they created this score and it was based off of mortality um, according to, again, their admission Hunt Hess grade. So when they presented um, and, you know, and then they had um, a mortality rate, which honestly has not changed much. So the Hunt Hess grade is still a very good marker of mortality, um, or at least how sick and the amount of complications you can expect from this patient. So just to go over it briefly, you know, um, Hunt Hess one, mild headache, two, severe headache or cranial nerve deficit, three, confusion, lethargy, maybe lateralized weakness, some neurologic symptoms, four, stupor, five, coma. And a hunt has five, has about a 70% mortality rate. Still pretty catastrophic. Okay. The other thing that we look for when a patient freshly comes in is their modified fissure scale. So the modified fissure, um, you know, classifies uh, radiographic severity of a subarachnoid hemorrhage and ultimately predicts the risk of vasospasm and delayed cerebral ischemia. Um, and we look at the thickness of the blood in the subarachnoid space and the presence of intraventricular hemorrhage. So if you just go here, a modified fissure one, is focal or diffuse thin subarachnoid hemorrhage, no IVH. A modified fissure two is focal or diffuse thin subarachnoid hemorrhage with IVH. Three, thick subarachnoid hemorrhage um, plus no IVH and then thick subarachnoid hemorrhage with IVH is number four, which clearly is um, the worst. And thick is really defined as, you know, hemorrhage filling one or more cisterns and fissures out of 10 or just greater than one millimeter. Okay, so modified fissure, obviously one to four, four being the worst. And as you can see in this upward trajectory, you are, it's associated with um, increased, oops, increased uh, risk of vasospasm and DCI, which we will discuss soon. Okay, so back to our case, this was the hemorrhage. And, you know, it was uh, her exam. Um, actually, I forgot her exam, but I wrote a Hunt has four here. Um, and then a modified fissure four um, is here, thick blood. And then um, there was definitely some IVH. And this is IVH, just to point it out. Oh, and that's intraventricular hemorrhage. Okay. And then this, if you look, there is a hemorrhage here. Um, and I, I put in this picture because, you know, sometimes there's a little bit of uh, maybe an ICH component or there's a, there's more of um, a, um, a hematoma, like a, more of just an ICH component and, and blood congregate in one area that isn't it's beyond the star sign. And normally that points to where the aneurysm is. So in this case um, here, it was ACOM. 
Okay, so back to our case, you know, we saw the head CT, it revealed uh, diffuse subarachnoid hemorrhage and hydrocephalus, an EVD was placed, and the patient's mental status improved. Excellent. Um, you know, so these are common orders. So now you're a neuro ICU provider, maybe you're in the NICU and you're getting a subarachnoid hemorrhage or somewhere where all of a sudden a, um, a subarachnoid hemorrhage comes and you're taking care of them. You're going to you know, you're putting in for labs, you're looking at goals, you want platelets greater than 50,000, although I would argue 100, actually. Um, Nemotipine 60Q4, Kepra 750Q12. Um, this is the number that some centers do 750, some centers do 500, some centers do not put their patients on um, any anti-epileptics. Um, and unless they unless they have seizure, but this is a prophylactic um, uh, AED, and it's until the aneurysm, aneurysm is secured, or again, till three you know for three to seven days post bleed, EKG, TTE, daily TCDs. Again, these are just orders that we would be putting in. You would be putting in for bed rest, and you would be putting in an arterial line. And these orders are important because, you know, our goals right now before securing. The aneurysm, hold on just one second. Um, goals before securing the aneurysm um, is to prevent re-rupture. So while we're in our sprint, we're trying to get the patient, you know, blood pressure down. Do you need an EVD? Can I take care of that hydrocephalus or ABCs? You're trying to um, get them to, um, you know, interventional neuro uh, radiology or neurosurgery for clipping, and you really want to prevent re-rupture. And re-rupture, um, which we'll talk about in a second, is like the worst complication. Um, it, well, maybe cardiac arrest is, but but it's it is the, the a very bad complication. Um, so early on. So what do we do? We avoid straining, valsalva, any sort of pressure in the abdomen that would then also increase your ICP um, or blood pressure. You also don't wanna over sedate the patient because obviously we want to watch the exam. You wanna treat pain with short acting medications, make sure that they have antiemetics um, if they feel nauseous because you don't want them retching. And then we'll talk about the use of antifibrinolytic drips. So, Back to our case. Patient comes up to the unit from the ED. Um, she's obtunded. What do you think is wrong? Any thoughts from the peanut gallery? Nope. We don't know, huh? Oh. Hydro. Okay, that's a good one. Yes. Okay, yes, absolutely. Hydro. It, what else is on the differential? Seizure, rebleed, seizing. Oh, man, yes. Okay, excellent. Yes. Rerupture, hydrocephalus, seizure. Perfect. Exactly. So early complications, rerupture. So rerupture is one of the scariest, again, early complications. I mean, it can happen later, but anywho, um, it's, it, it shouldn't. What we're talking about is early re-rupture. And um, the, highest re -rate, the highest rate of re-rupture is in the first 24 hours, with majority occurring in the first six hours, but it can occur up to 72 hours. And so that's why we drop that blood pressure to less than 140. And risk factors for rebleeds, as you can think of, would be extremely poor grade. Um, Hunt has five subarachnoid hemorrhage. Again, having hypertension, having a large aneurysm, maybe having some sort of antiplatelet, anticoagulation on board. Um, and so that's why you're, you're pushing for securement of the aneurysm. Um, and 20 to 70% mortality. So that is, that's extremely high once you've had re-rupture. Hydrocephalus, again, EVD placement allows both treatment of hydrocephalus and also um, measurement of ICPs and monitoring. Um, and 
of hydrocephalus will happen in the first 48 hours. Seizure uh, is important because, um, again, before the aneurysm is secured, some institutions will actually start Keppra in order to prevent a seizure causing re-rupture. So there'll be some um, anti-epileptics on board. And when patients have seizures and subarachnoid hemorrhage, there's actually an association with worse functional outcome, although there is no effect on mortality. So you, you want to be cognizant about, uh, about seizure. And then obviously you have Takasubo cardiomyopathy, which is a stress cardiomyopathy. I'm sorry, I'm going to cough. Excuse me. Um, a stress cardiomyopathy um, that can occur very early on when you had uh, when the, your patient had the initial bleed. There was a surge of ICP. There's a surge of catecholamines, and you know there's also a surge of catecholamines on your heart, causing a stress cardiomyopathy. And then also neurogenic pulmonary edema. Again, with all of these catecholamine surges, you have an increase of blood pressure and you can also have um, filling of the capillaries in uh, your lungs. So antifibrinolytic therapy, it does not reduce pre-procedural re-bleeding. Um, you know, that is the takeaway. If, you know, I'm here, I am talking about re-bleeding. If it's such a terrifying complication, why don't we do something to help the aneurysm clot until you can get secure? Doesn't that make sense? Well, yes. So people, we thought that, and, you know, amicar, transoxemic acid um, were used and studied. However, there was a large retrospective um, study over 12 years, and then later a Cochrane review. And it found that it was safe to do, but it did not actually decrease the pre-procedural re-bleeding. However, the recommendation actually though, is early and limited use to less than 72 hours. Um, and again, it's a weak recommendation, but if unfortunately, if somebody is in an area where they can't transfer a patient or um, you know they can't have access to a neurosurgeon for a while, this is something that may be possible. Okay. So again, going, looking at systemic complications, this is just a little bit more about the why and how um, Takasubo uh, cardiomyopathy happens. And hold on, I'm just trying to, oops, how Takasubo's cardiomyopathy happens, you know, something, you know, ICP, maybe some hypothalamic injury, and again, excessive release of catecholamines um, causing myocardial contraction necrosis. Um, and you'll get apical ballooning right here, if you can see this, and it's supposed to look like this octopus trap. Okay, and again, neurogenic pulmonary edema. Um, there's two theories, the capillary leakage theory and the blast theory. Both really have to do with a sympathetic surge, but the capillary leakage theory is really just that the capillaries leak, regardless of how high your blood pressure is. The blast theory is really just you have an SB, you know, blood pressure surge and it's causing barotrauma to the capillary uh, endothelium um, and therefore causing leakage as well and, and pulmonary edema. Okay, and he, this is just an example of. Um, neurogenic pulmonary edema. And this can actually lead to ARDS. It can be very severe. So we've talked a lot about um, getting your patient from the ED. They're in your ICU, hopefully, and you know, you're stabilizing them. You're like, all right, I'm thinking about it. The EVD has been placed. You've maybe started Kepra 500 BID for, um, or I should say Le Levetiracetam 500 BID for, um, you know, uh, seizure prophylaxis, you've placed an A-line, you've gotten your labs, your blood pressure is under control, et cetera, et cetera. So now you're like, okay, when are we going to clip or coil this aneurysm? And, and what should we do? Should we clip or should we coil? Um, and, you know, the, um, the short answer that I always learned is you should do what your neurosurgeon is best at, <laughs> but there's actually evidence to support what we should do. Okay. So, um, that was, that was just a joke, kind of. Okay, so surgical management of subarachnoid hemorrhage, coiling. So what coiling is, is, so again, this is um, a cerebral angiogram. Oh, that was just, that was just to show 
you know, it's endovascular coiling. It's through a groin puncture, as you can see here in this in this picture of this gentleman. Um, you through a groin puncture and up the arterial system to the brain. And what you do in, is you see here this aneurysm. You pack it full of these coils, and you know, I, I guess I'm going to ask the group a question: How? What is the mechanism that a coil actually? Um, secures an aneurysm. So how does packing this thing full of coils secure the aneurysm? Excellent. Good job. OK, this is great. OK, so um, the aneurysm does it clots off. Um, exact, it clots off by so by packing this full of coils, you cause a rand, you know, as we've always learned, right? Stasis of blood can create a clot. Stasis of blood and, and turbulent flow and random flow and slowness here, stasis will actually cause it to clot itself off. So excellent job. Um, and, you know, when should you do surgical coiling? Again, it's a procedure, it's invasive, you know, it's just intravascular. So it's not terribly invasive. Um, but the indication for patients that have older age and multiple comorbidities, they can't undergo a craniotomy um, and a clipping perhaps, um, poor clinical grade and top of the basilar aneurysm. That is when you should definitely do surgical coiling. When should you do clipping? And again, this is um, clipping here this is putting a clip literally over the neck. And it's when you have a wide neck and also when you have maybe an MCA aneurysm because you're able to actually access it surgically because there's no, it is very difficult to access a, a basilar tip, you know, aneurysm um, surgically, but an MCA, maybe something that has a wide neck. And the reason why for wide neck is because, um, let me just see if I can draw. It really would be nice. Just, no, okay, no, all right. Um, anyway, sorry. Okay, so um, a wide neck because the coils will, I mean, it's not that they will actually fall out, but they'll, they'll fall out um, when you have a wide neck. And this is the neck of the aneurysm. So the coils cannot stay as compact in there or they shut out. And so it's, it's just not a good thing. But was there perhaps a study that looked at, um, Clipping and coiling, maybe a couple. Yes, so there was the ISAT trial, um, the BRAT trial, cerebral, aneur uh, cerebral aneurysm, re-rupture after treatment, like taking a look at all of these things. So clipping and coiling. Clipping, you know, the pros, lower risk of re-bleeding and recurrence of aneurysm, no difference in poor outcomes, rate of pretreatment, and aneurysm obliteration favored over clipping. Um, oh, sorry, rate of pretreatment and aneurysm obliteration favored clipping. Coiling, there's a higher risk of rebleeding and recurrence. Decreased disability at one year, which is important. Lower risk of epilepsy. More likely to be alive and independent with an MRS year to two at 10 years. Um, and 58% uh, mortality among early post-procedure re-ruptures with coiling. So, you know, after the public, uh, after the publication of the International Subarachnoid Aneurysm Trial, or ISAT, coiling has been favored to clipping. Um, and now with, you know, stent-assisted coiling, broader neck aneurysms can be treated. Um, again, kind of, so, you know, coiling has been a, um, uh, a, bit, a much more common thing to be done. And again, this is just uh, a slide that I already kind of talked about. Um, any questions so far? We have, we have about 15 to 20 minutes left and I'm gonna you know, change gears and just really talk about vasospasm and delayed cerebral ischemia. So this would be a good time to just ask about anything no. Okay. Good. All right. So the patient had hydrocephalus from yeah, our I think last. The, I think um, I'm not sure if that's a new question. Sorry, Judy. It says, how did stents change decision-making? 
Oh, how did Stens change decision making? Oh, sorry, I didn't see that question. Okay, great. So Stens, Stens changed decision making because they allowed for more aneurysms, honestly, to be coiled. Um, so for example, uh, blister aneurysms, we didn't really know what to do with those. Um, again, aneurysms that um, maybe uh, had wider necks that wouldn't have, that would have been really difficult to clip are now amenable to coiling. So pretty much a, a lot of different uh, and difficult aneurysms um, have now been helped with uh, stent assisted coiling. Thank you for your question. Oh, sorry, I'm changing slides. Okay, so delayed cerebral ischemia. Um, is the most feared neurologic complication after, you know, so we've begun the marathon part, we've clipped or we've coiled the patient, and now we're worried about DCI. The clock has started. Um, oh yeah, that's where we were at. You know, on day of admission, the patient's ACOM aneurysm was coiled. On day seven, the patient develops new agitation and left lower extremity weakness. Who's feeling nervous? That's right. We all should be feeling nervous. And so, you know, we all are worried about delayed cerebral ischemia, which the definition is any neurologic deterioration that persists for more than one hour and cannot be explained by any other neurologic or systemic condition, such as fever, seizures, hydrocephalus, sepsis, hypoxemia, sedation, and other metabolic causes. So, you, you know, it's not, it can't be explained by something else. Um, and, you know, it is a neurologic deficit. And we think it's, you know, DCI is not only due to vasospasm. I want, I like to say it's vasospasm plus because, you know, it's early brain injury, microthrombosis, cortical spreading depolarizations. It's all of these secondary injuries that happen to the brain that contribute to DCI. So it's not just vasospasm. Um, okay. So anywho, post bleed day three to 14, we're getting nervous. There's obviously an increased risk uh, with patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage thickness and IVH based off of your modified fissure. Okay, so vasospasm, let's just talk about it. What is it? It is the narrowing of the cerebral arteries, as you can see in these examples. Um, here is the MCA, you guys can see it. And here it is nice and plump after some treatment. And then here, we have some more pictures of vasospasm. It's so narrow. And then here, I mean, look at that. Uh, now that is striking, right? The ICA. Okay. So again, it starts around days three to five. And again, this is why post bleed day blank, post bleed day zero, post bleed day two, post bleed day seven, post bleed day 11 um, is so important to keep track of um, because it allows everyone on the team, it allows yourself, it allows um, you know, just uh, everyone who's listening to you to, re to realize where are we in the course of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Day three to five, and, you know, it starts around days three to five, post-bleed day, and peaks around six to eight. Some patients have, you know, most patients will have a complete resolution by day 14, but the window actually goes to 21 and beyond. And I've seen it go beyond 21 days into like day 30, 35. Um, it, it can be extremely um, uh, prolonged course, especially when um, patients are young and when patients have used other sympathomimetic uh, drugs. So there's a difference between symptomatic vasospasm and angiographic vasospasm. So angiographic vasospasm, meaning that you see it on some form of um, imaging, right? So angiographic vasospasm occurs in over two thirds of all patients. And um, DCI, delayed cerebral ischemia, 20 to 25% of vasospasm, it'll you know, yield a focal neurologic deficit cor cor corresponding to the area of vasospasm. Again, if this isn't treated early, what you 
really are scared of is an ischemic stroke. And vasospasm accounts for 50% of mortality associated with subarachnoid hemorrhage patients um, that actually survived to, to treatment. Okay, so what do we do to detect vasospasm and then ultimately DCI? So TCDs, transcranial Dopplers, again, they have high specific, specificity, but low sensitivity. And the MCA is the most sensitive. Um, Velocity is greater than 120 centimeters per second, greater than 120, you know, you have a decrease in blood vessel diameter by 50%. That's what we're looking at. That's why we're looking at these numbers. So we get them daily for 21 days. But the thing about TCDs is it's very operator dependent. Um, if you've ever seen TCDs being done, it's like you're, you're well, here it is on the screen. Um, you're putting, you know, a, a probe here and what you're looking for is like a velocity tick. So you're actually looking for the, you know, you're, you're trying to pick up on this signal and you know you are in the brain based off of how deep you are and what like vessel should be there. And then also based off of the velocities and the direction. Um, so it can be very operator dependent. So it's really good if you have um, the same person doing the same TCDs, um, you know, on the same patient. So CTA and CT perfusion, 80% sensitive, 93% specific. Sometimes it can overcall spasm. Um, again, it's less accurate for distal spasm, which makes sense. EEG, you know, we can look at the alpha delta ratio. And then also what we can do is we can actually do, put in um, a bolt monitor and measure the PVTO2. We can do microdialysis and all of these things will help um, us kind of uh, diagnose vasospasm or DCI. Okay, this is, I, I, I forgot that I had a slide that went on about this rant <laughs> about angiographic versus symptomatic vasospasm. Um, only symptomatic has been associated with DCI and poor outcome. So that's important, right? Is if you're, um, if what you're looking at, the spasm actually causes symptoms. But however, we try to be prevent, you know, okay, well, we'll go into how we prevent um, DCI. So this is a picture of a basilar artery here. This is pre-treatment and this is post-treatment. I'm sorry, I'm getting a phone call. One second. Hello? Hi, I'm, oh, I'm trying to mute myself. Um, okay, sorry guys. Um, okay, so this was not supposed to be, I think I, I skipped some slides. Yes, I did. Okay, here it is. Okay, so DCI prevention and treatment. Also, we have five minutes left, so I'm going to go a little bit faster, but we're almost done, I promise. So we try to prevent DCI, again, just delayed cerebral ischemia by administering nimodipine um, and keeping patients euvolemic. Again, we don't try to keep them hypervolemic. We actually try to avoid hypervolemia because it doesn't help. It's actually euvolemia that we're aiming for. Um, induced hypertension, which means we, when we say we press patients, we're trying to iatrogenically raise the blood pressure, right? If you think about it, there's a small hose and you're trying to force um, as much blood and oxygen through. And so you're going to try to increase the pressure. Um, cerebral angioplasty, again, that's an angiogram where they go in and they do an angioplasty, which means that they open up the vesicle mechanically, or they give an intraarterial vasodilator with, you know, like IAV rapamil. Um, optimal hemoglobin, eight to 10, again, being able to have um, enough hemoglobin to carry the oxygen to the brain is also very important, um, but it has very moderate evidence to do that. So for induced hypertension, you know, we will go, you know, we'll, you'll, start, you'll start somebody on pressors, vasopressors, like norepinephrine, phenylephrine, et cetera, and it can get 
to the point where you're actually using advanced cardiac devices, such as an impella or a balloon pump. Um, Euvolemia, um, our patients will have fully catheters and we'll be watching their eyes and nose extremely closely. Um, and on to the other items. Um, again, we talked about angioplasty, but the other two things that I wanted to talk about would where it was stellate ganglion block and milrinone. So the stellate ganglion is, you know, a, a collection of nerves, sympathetic nerves found at the level of the sixth to seventh um, cervical vertebrae. Um, and they're located in the front and they are part of the sympathetic nervous system and supply the face and the arm. Um, and you know, what you do is you do a local block here, uh, an injection of an anesthetic such as bupivacaine to the stellate ganglion. Um, and the hypothesis is, the theory is that this injection will reduce sympathetic input to the cerebral vasculature, thereby promoting vasodilation. So right, sympathetics, you're gonna vasoconstrict and thereby, and so if you get rid of sympathetics, you're actually going to promote vasodilation and increase blood flow. So you're trying to fight the vasospasm there. There only really, there's not much in the literature to support this, but other than like small case series demonstrating the association of stellate ganglion blocks and improved cerebral perfusion um, based off of TCD and improvement in GCS. And you can do, um, you know, ipsilateral and contralateral. Um, the recommendation, though, is not is that you don't do them both at the same time. And then one other, one other. Oh, we have two minutes. Okay, so we're going to talk about milrinone. Um, and milrinone is promising, uh, is promising and safe. Um, it is, you know, a phosphodiesterase three in, uh, inhibitor, and you know, it leads to smooth muscle relaxation. Um, in both the arterial and the venous vessels, which is important. And we'll talk about why it causes also, you know, most of the time we hear about it um, for cardiac reasons, it increases cardiac output, and it also may have an anti-inflammatory effect. So, but we use it for the vasodilation of the cerebral artery uh, vasculature. And, you know, it was hot off the press, but now it's 2022. Um, Milrospasm came out as an, it was an observational study looking at giving patients, you know, just drip, putting patients on milrinone drips. Um, and it was actually associated with a lower likelihood of six month um, functional disability and also, um, you know, vasospasm related brain infarction. So that was very good. And also, you know, and also just angioplasties um, were actually less frequent in the milrinone group. However, milrinone does have its side effects. It can, right, since it, it induces smooth muscle relaxation in arteries and veins, it can cause a systemic vasodilation and can actually cause hypotension. And what I said earlier, right, we're trying to increase the blood pressure. So it actually can cause hypotension, which is what we don't want. So we do press through it. It also increases flow, you know, to the kidneys causing polyuria, he can cause hyponatremia, hypokalemia, all the things we hate when we're managing subarachnoid hemorrhages. However, it found that like arrhythmias, MIs, and thrombocytopenias were actually not that common. Thrombocytopenia was not that common. So, and this was just a uh, a review, and and this is just a um, uh, what am I trying to say? Um, a protocol that was used. Okay, um, it's three o'clock. I was just really going to mention central fevers and infections and, um, and then just show this Takasubo pocus slide on one of our patients that we had. Um, as you can see, this is the apical ballooning that, uh, that is, is classic. And you can see that, you know, you have constriction at the, at the basilar walls. Okay. Um, do you have any questions?